Income tax 2023-2024. Health savings account HSA deduction. Get ready and some coffee because we're looking to get the tax man off our back with income tax preparation 2023-2024. Most of this information comes from the instructions for schedule one section of the form 1040 instructions tax year 2023 as well as instructions for form 8889 health savings accounts HSAs 2023 which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov irs.gov. Looking at the income tax formula, we're focused on line two, adjustments to income. Remember in the first half of the income tax formula is in essence a funny income statement. Income statements typically having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income. Deductions for taxes being goods, therefore we're always looking to increase them if we can. Noting the major differences in the categories of deductions, the adjustments to income or above the line deductions and the below the line deductions, standard or itemized deductions. One of those differences being that if you qualify for a above the line deduction, or adjustment to income, you don't have to clear a hurdle such as the standard deduction before you get a benefit from those items. First page of the form 1040, we're looking at line number 10, adjustments to income from schedule one. Here is the schedule one part two, which is the adjustments to income. We're focused on line 13, which is the health savings account deduction. And you can attach form 8889. You can look at the instructions from form 8889 for more detail as well. All right, line number 13. We have the health savings account. It's an HSA deduction. You may be able to take this deduction if contributions other than employer contributions, rollovers, and qualified HAS uh, uh, funds distributions from an IRA were made to your HSA for 2023. There's more detail, of course, that can be found in form 8889. That's the summary or line instruction. Let's go into a bit more of that detail. A health savings account. What is it? It's a tax advantaged medical savings account available to taxpayers in the United States who are enrolled in a high deductible health plan. That's an HDHP. Now, some of this terminology uh, is a little bit wonky and can get first a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever, because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Somewhat confusing. And it kind of goes back to when they were trying to adjust everything during the Obama administration. You, can, you might remember that they had this big argument with the Obamacare and the kind of some of the details of it from my perspective was that they were trying to simplify uh, the healthcare uh, process, and there's arguments in terms of how to better deal with that situation. And the situation is going to be obviously the cost of healthcare is quite high, and then the people that are able to get uh, healthcare, you want to make sure that everybody has the uh, capacity to get healthcare. One of the arguments for why healthcare was high is because you have this free rider problem, in that if people don't actually purchase healthcare, then they still get they still do get health benefits because if they go to an emergency room or they have a problem they are, are going to typically be treated in which case that cost is basically taken on by the others that are paying for the premiums of the insurance which increases the insurance so part of what they wanted to do is is force everybody to have health insurance and if you don't buy health insurance then they were going to basically uh, penalize you and then they also part of the plan seemed to be that they wanted to centralize uh, the healthcare with less competition and whatnot, and rather try to make everything 
uh, more streamlined and uh, similar in nature. Now, some of that kind of went through and some of it uh, did not. And we ended up with some of this terminology uh, with regards to the types of health plans. And so now you've got this idea of a high deductible health plan. Now, high deductible, deductibles are typically the idea of what you have to pay when you actually get the benefit from when you pay for health care. So if I go and pay for, for health care of some kind, do I have to pay for it or uh, is there going to be, is it just going to be covered by the insurance? So that's tied in with the, the deductible. And the idea of a high deductible plan is usually with younger people that are healthy, the idea would be you might want more of a high deductible plan because you don't plan on going to regular doctor visits and whatnot. And because you're healthy and you don't have as much health problems. And then when you do get uh, go to the doctor, you, 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 you can pay the higher deductible, but you'll have lower premiums uh, is the general idea. So from that perspective, it's not like the best plan. It's not like the, the plan that you would get from the a rich person would probably have not have a high, everything would be covered uh, type of thing. So the high deductible plan might be more likely to be lower income individuals that have the high deductible plan. And then if you have the high deductible plan, uh, then you might also qualify, then the government wants to subsidize those plans. And that's when you might also be able to get these uh, HSAs. So that's kind of a, a general recap again from my uh, perspective. So some of the terminology we need to know is, are we dealing with a high deductible uh, health plan? And then how are we getting access to the health plan? And if so, you might have an HSA, but there's also another problem that's also thrown into there. And that is that you might have a credit if you have a high deductible health plan for related to health insurance. And that credit might be prepaid. And that's another complication to try to determine uh, how much you're paying paying for for healthcare? Okay, given that HSAs have several tax benefits that make them an attractive option for saving and paying medical expenses. Here's a breakdown of the tax advantages. So you have pre-tax contributions. Now you can think this is another tool that you can think of as being similar to like an IRA. I compare it to an IRA because I think most people have a more of a better concept of an IRA and the tax consequences with it. And the points of tax consequences that we're questioning are, if I'm putting money into an HSA, which we're imagining to be a savings account here, it is a savings account, there's nothing different about the investment tool itself in a similar way as there's nothing different about usually mutual funds that you're putting money into when you're putting money into an IRA. That the fact that it's under the umbrella of an IRA doesn't change the nature of the financial instrument in that you're still just using a normal financial instrument. It's just under the umbrella of an IRA, or in this case, an HSA, which actually restricts sometimes the funds that you put into it, which means you would not normally put funds into it unless there's a tax benefit. So the question is, when I put the money in, do I get a tax benefit when that happens? which would mean I would either lower income or get a deduction. When the, the savings account earns money through interest or if it was dividends or whatnot, do I have to pay taxes when it earns the money or possibly can I defer them or not pay the taxes? And then when we take the money out of the account, is that a tax triggering effect? And is it something that could also trigger penalties or whatnot? Those are the tax consequences. When I put the money in, when the money grows, when I take the money out, what are the tax consequences? All right. Pre-tax contributions. Contributions to an HSA are made with pre-tax dollars. So meaning we're reducing the income, which is good, through payroll deductions, which means they reduce your taxable income. So if you make contributions with those pre-tax dollars, you can deduct the amounts from your gross income on your tax return, reducing your overall tax liability. So note we have a general question here is, is it happening through work? If it's happening through work, then possibly this will be reflected on the W-2 form. If it's not happening through work, then it's not going to be reflected on the W-2 form. And therefore, you might have this above the line adjustment. So tax deductible contributions, contributions you make to an HSA are tax deductible up to the legal limit for 2023. The IRS has set the contribution limits 
to $3,850 for individuals and $7,750 for family coverage. Those over 55 years old can make an additional catch-up contribution of $1,000. So tax-free growth. So here we're talking about the next component. You put money in, you get a benefit possibly when you put the money in. What about when the money grows in the savings account through possibly interest, for example? So, so usually you have to pay tax on interest, right? Tax-free growth. Any interest or other earnings on the money in the HSA grow tax-free so it can get a good long-term saving strategy. So tra tax-free withdrawals. So that's the third part. Now, what happens when we take the money out? Is that going to be subject to taxes? In, the, in which case, it would be a deferral. If it's not subject to taxes, then that's great. You didn't have to pay the taxes on it at all, right? So funds withdrawn from the HSA for qualified medical expenses, including deductibles, co-payments, and other expenses that health insurance doesn't cover are not taxed. So there's the catch. You have to then make sure that you're in compliance with the rules, and then you have to pay for the things that are covered for, uh, and, and, in, in order for it to qualify to be tax-free. Otherwise, it might be subject to tax when you pull it out, as we saw on the income side of things, for HSA. So if you withdrew funds for non-medical expenses before age 65, you'll have to pay income tax on the withdrawal plus 20% penalty. Ouch, that's a high penalty. After age 65, you can withdraw funds for any purpose without penalty, but you'll still owe taxes if the withdrawal is not used for qualified medical expenses. So note this is a little bit different than like an IRA, right? You're putting the money in, and then usually with an IRA, when you take the money out, you have to pay taxes on it, which means you've got a deferral, but not a complete removal of taxes. Here, if you take the money out and you pay for qualified education or qualified uh, medical expenses, then you might not have to pay taxes on it at all. And then if you're out, if you're older than 65, you might still have money in there that you want to pull out. And in that case, you might be able to pull it out without paying for uh, medical expenses, in which case you'd have to pay taxes on it, which means you would have had a deferral similar to an IRA. But if you pay for the qualified medical expenses, you might not have to pay any tax on it at all. Okay. Ownership and portability. An HSA is owned by an individual, which means it's portable. The account stays with you if you change employers or leave the workforce. Now, this is one of the things that's been kind of a problem in the past as we've had changes, societal changes over time. It used to be that health care was often tied to a place of employment, people often working for the same place for their entire life. And those kind of benefits are can be great because there's things that you can give, the employer can give, but there are also things that lock people into a particular job. It's difficult to go from one job to another if your entire pension and your health plan and everything is tied to that one job, right? That's, that's a way that a job can kind of tie you into it as well. So there's pros and cons of it. So here they're saying the HSA is owned by the individual, which means it's portable, which means, you know, might leave you still free to, to move to another job if you need to. Eligible individual. So to be eligible to have contributions made to your HSA, you must uh, be covered under a high deductible health plan. So here's one of the things that I, th I believe basically, you know, changed a bit when they were trying to do all that stuff to the, the health insurance. They tried to make this hardcore line definition of what it means to be a high deductible plan. So consequently, you should be able to determine the plans usually will be quite clear that it is or it is not a high covered or classified as a high deductible uh, health plan. And obviously, if it is a high deductible health plan that you could think of it as bad or good because it means, well, there's a high deductible. That's usually bad. But then it qualifies for these benefits because they're trying to subsidize the bad plan because it's possible lower income individuals are going to have that plan. So you could, so you, any case, that's how it is. And have no other health insurance except certain uh, disregarded coverage. So if you are an eligible individual, anyone can contribute to uh, your health savings account. However, you cannot be eligible in Medicare or be another person's dependent. So it gets a little bit confusing. Our health system note that you're paying for insurance, but then when you reach eligibility for Medicare, then Medicare, it, is basically going to be you know one of the primary kind of insurance 
So you have that kind of interplay when someone's in their working years and whatnot, they, they're going to have their own health insurance, which might be a high deductible health plan. And then there could be differences or whatnot when they become subject or able to apply for Medicare. So an individual does not fail to be treated as an eligible individual for any period merely because the individual receives hospital care or medical services under any law administrated by the Secretary of Veterans Affairs for a service-connected disability. So you will not fail to be considered an eligible individual because you receive benefits from a health saving plan under sur uh, surprise billing uh, laws. You must be or must be or be considered an eligible individual on the first day of the month to take an HSA deduction for that month. See last month rule. So what's the last month rule? Uh, if you are an eligible individual on the first day of the last month of your tax year, December 1st, uh, for most taxpayers, uh, you are considered to be an eligible individual for the entire year, so long as you remain an eligible individual during the testing period as discussed below. Okay, so what's the testing period? So you must remain an eligible individual during the testing period in order to take advantage of the last month rule. The testing period begins with the last month of your tax year and ends on the last day of the 12th month following that month. For example, December 1st, 2023 uh, to December 31st, 2024. So if you fail to remain an eligible individual during this period other than because of death, or becoming disabled, you will not have to include in income the total contributions made uh, that would uh, not have been made except for the last month rule. So you include this amount in income in the year in which you fail to be an eligible individual. This amount is also subject to a 10% additional tax. All right, account beneficiary. So the account beneficiary is the individual on whose behalf the HSA was established. So obviously you're putting up an HSA, a high deductible uh, health insurance. So who's the, the person that you're putting that in place on behalf of? HSA, generally an HSA is a health savings account set up exclusively for paying the qualified medical expenses of the account beneficiary or the account beneficiary's spouse or dependents. So then you have the technical issue of just basically setting up the HSA and obviously what is the actual HSA, a health savings, an HSA is a health savings account which is set up exclusively for paying the qualified medical expenses of the account beneficiary or the account beneficiary spouse or dependent. Distributions from an HSA. So now we're talking about the money that's coming out of the HSA, which again is the last point in time that we might consider, is there gonna be a tax consequence? Usually the question here being, do we have to include anything in income and is it subject to penalty? Distributions from an HSA used exclusively to pay qualified medical expenses of the account beneficiary, spouse, or dependents are excludable from gross income. So that's good. So see the line 15 instructions for information on medical expenses of dependents not claimed on your return. So you can receive distributions from an HSA even if you are not currently eligible to have contributions made to the HSA. However, any part of a distribution not used to pay qualified medical expenses is includable in gross income and is subject to an additional 20% uh, uh, tax unless an exception applies. So what are qualified medical expenses then? Generally, qualified medical expenses for HSA purposes are unreimbursed medical expenses that could otherwise be deducted on Schedule A, Form 1040. So you can look at the instructions for medical expenses on Form 1040, which a lot of people don't have a lot of familiarity with because you might not be itemizing, number one, if you're lower income or if you don't own a home at least, and number two, because if you do own a home and you are itemizing and your income is high, then it, it also has a limitation that you have to clear or a floor that you have to clear. But in any case, you can look at those instructions. See the instructions for Schedule A and Publication 502, Medical and Dental Expenses. Now, whenever we get into these expenses for like medical stuff, it's kind of messy. It's very messy. 
because you can get a doctor to say that you need anything, right? Look at look at these days. They got they got doctors saying that you need to have fully functioning body parts that cut off and whatnot. It's crazy. So so you could find a doctor to say you could find a doctor to say that you need a trip to Hawaii or something like that, and they'll be like, oh yeah, that's a medical expense, right? But obviously you need a jacuzzi. I need a sauna in my home. Ah, it's a medical. So these questions come up like all the time. Uh, and there and there and sometimes there's court cases and people will argue as to whether uh, it's a qualified medical expenses or not. So you can go into the into the craziness of basically asking whether or not this or that thing qualifies as uh, a medical expense. But a lot of it has probably been mapped out, if not in the law itself, in court cases and whatnot, where the IRS is arguing over whether something qualifies as a medical expense or not. This is also a, a weird area where people start to to treat things as diseases when when I think it would be detrimental to treat them as a disease like they start calling people obese as a disease even though even when they're not even weren't technically obese before which I think is not healthy to tell people that it's a disease because then they feel like and but then you get tax benefits from it if you call it a disease and like and it goes it's a mess any case as the HSA account beneficiary, you can pay these expenses for medical care for yourself, your spouse, and your dependents. So even though non-prescription medicines other than insulin do not qualify for medical and dental expense deduction, they do qualify as expenses for HSA purposes. The cost of uh, menstrual care products, tampons, pads, liners, cups, sponges, or other similar products, that made me a little uncomfortable to read that whole thing, are also reimbursed for HSA purposes. So amounts you pay for personal protective equipment, such as masks, hand sanitizer, and sanitizing uh, wipes for you, your spouse, and your dependents for the primary purpose of preventing the spread of, of COVID-19 are treated as medical expenses. The cost of home testing for COVID-19 for you, your spouse, your dependents is an eligible medical expense. Okay, you cannot treat insurance premiums as qualified medical expenses unless the premiums are for long-term care. So now we have the qualifications of, of health insurance, which gets, again, kind of, kind of tricky because you have basically, you know, the, the general health insurance, which might be your high deductible plan that you're in. But if you go over a certain age, then you have the Medicare kind of system that might be then the normal kind of insurance. And then you have the long term care insurance, which is generally thought of, of insurance against being basically like needing full time care. Uh, uh, of, of basic kind of things, which is kind of an, a whole nother thing in and of itself. So healthcare uh, conting uh, continuation coverage, such as coverage under uh, COBRA. So if you leave your job and you have continuation coverage, the COBRA is supposed to help so you don't lose the insurance and then possibly need to purchase it again, in which case it sometimes could be difficult to do, possibly because of preconditions and so on. So healthcare coverage while receiving unemployment compensation under federal or state law or Medicare and other health care uh, coverage if you were 65 or older other than premiums for Medicare supplemental policies such as Medigap. Okay, high deductible health plan. And HDHP, high deductible health plan, is a, is a health plan that meets the following requirements. So you have the minimum annual uh, deductible. So for the self only, 1,500 for the family, 3,000, and then the maximum annual out of pocket expenses, 7,500 and 15,000. So a lot of times when you hunt down the plans, they're they're more pretty pretty explicit about whether they qualify or don't qualify, say as a high deductible plan. But there's that technical kind of uh, of qualification uh, for it. Figuring your HSA deduction. The maximum amount that can be contributed to your HSA depends on the type of high deductible health plan coverage you have. If you have self only coverage, your maximum contribution is 3,850. If you have family coverage, your maximum contribution is 7,750. Note, if you are age 55 or older at the end of your tax year, you can make an additional contribution of 1,000. Your maximum contribution is reduced 
by any employer contributions to your HSA, any contributions made to your Archer MSA, and any qualified HSA funding distributions. You can make deductible contributions to your HSA even if your employer made contributions. However, if you or someone on your behalf made contributions in addition to any employer contributions and qualified HSA funding distributions, you may have to pay an additional tax. So you cannot deduct any contributions for any month in which you were enrolled in Medicare. Also, you cannot deduct contributions if you are someone else's dependent for 2023.